would you rather be? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and welcome to the People of Penn State podcast. Each week on the podcast, you can expect to hear the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they're passionate about, and you can expect to feel the pride and the power of the Penn State network. You can find the People of Penn State podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast app of choice. Subscribe, give us a rating. You know, ratings are the best way to help others find our podcast. And we want to make sure that we spread these great stories out to as many Penn Staters as we possibly can. So go ahead and give us ratings and um, subscribe today. Really excited about the conversation that we're about to have with Penn Stater John Amici. You know, there's many things I can tell you about John. Obviously, there's all the stuff in his bio bio, which is extensive. He's a respected organizational psychologist and OBE. He's a chartered scientist. He is elected to the fellow of Royal Society for Public Health. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He's a research fellow at the University of East London and the founder of APS Intelligence. You know, that's all the stuff that you read in his bio. And then there's all the things that he does. He's a mentor. He's a teacher. He's always using his deep psychological insight combined with his real world experience to provide a touchstone for people and for companies who want to thrive, achieve, and align their beliefs, values, and ethics. But there are literally things that you really need to know about John. First of all, John is a giant. Literally, he's huge. He's also a dad, a brother, and an uncle. He's from Stockport, which to us in the United States might not mean very much, but John's going to explain um, how that means that he has had to overcome more than most uh, in his in his circumstance. People who think facts and evidence should bow to opinion drive John absolutely crazy. He's passionate about Star Wars. We're going to try to get him to give us another camera view so we can see that passion on the screen. He's a self-confessed geek. Oh, by the way, he happened to play a little bit of basketball in the NBA. And his voice is just going to mesmerize you. And you're going to enjoy listening to John for about the next 45 minutes to an hour in our conversation. I'm excited to get to that conversation. So let's welcome John Amici into the People of Penn State podcast. John, hello. How are you? I am well, and thank you for that introduction, Paul. I, I may have been oversold, but we'll see what we can do. We'll see. I, you always rise to the occasion and live up to to anything that folks have ever said about you. So let's first of all, you're in London. Thank you for joining us. It is um, it is the uh, probably the end of your work day there around around five o'clock. It's midday here uh, in State College, back here in Happy Valley. So thank you for for joining us. Let's start at the beginning and just give some people some context about your relationship to Penn State. Mm -hmm. You started as a basketball player at Vanderbilt, transferred to Penn State. How did you become a Nittany Lion? Um, So I I went to Vanderbilt. I I was essentially, no, I wasn't essentially told. I was actually told by the coach there, a guy called Ed Fogler, myself and Matt Maloney, who went to Penn, actually. Uh, he was my roommate. We were both told that if we wanted to play basketball, we should go to a Division two or three college. Mm. And at that point, we had a decision to make to either stick it out and hope that our annually renewed scholarship would be rene- renewed or to find new lodging. And so I went on a search, and I found, actually, that I was in more demand than I'd imagined for a pretty lackluster kind of freshman year. Uh, I went to arenas where I walked into the arena to this to, to a soundtrack that had been made um, of me, uh, you know, Amici gets the ball, he's on the court, he shoots, he scores, game winner, that kind of stuff. 
And then I came to Penn State and I walked into the abjectly worst, objectively worst gym that I had been into of any major uh, university. And I sat in the top set of bleachers just by what I thought at that time was old people running. They were my age. <laughs> um, and Bruce Parkhill sat next to me. And unlike everywhere else that I went, where they told me how great I would be, where they told me I was the best thing since sliced bread, he looked at me and said, if you work really hard, we can help you to become a player. And I looked at him and I thought, this is, I didn't want to hear this. I wanted to hear how great I was. But I looked at him and I realized this is the only man who's told me the truth. And, and that's why I came to Penn State um, and grew to love, <laughs> grew to love that horrible old gym. You know, it, it's interesting. You met, you mentioned Matt Maloney, right? I grew up in Pennsylvania. I know um, from following basketball when when I was younger, Matt Maloney is is one of the greats at the University of Pennsylvania in terms of basketball. He, I believe, went to three NCAA tournaments. And so um, what that coach didn't see in the two of you at Vanderbilt was really cultivated uh, at your next stops, uh, both for, for each of you in different ways. Absolutely so. I mean, um, uh, I, I, would just, I just had a conversation with Matt the other day. Um, we, we still keep in touch. And uh, it, we, we often laugh about the fact that Eddie Fogler didn't see in us any value. And yet we send, managed to find it in ourselves with help, with help. Absolutely. Talk a little bit about your time at Penn State and – uh, and what it was like to not only compete for the Nittany Lions, but also what your journey was like and what you learned about who John Amici was at that point in your life. You know, you know, it's a little bit sad, and I don't know if this will be resonant with anybody who's listening, but the moment you said, what was my time like at Penn State, the first thing that popped into my head was Chicken Cosmo. <laughs> <laughs> That I'm, will absolutely resonate. I'm, I'm, slightly embarrassed, of, I'm slightly embarrassed about that, but the moment you said it, that's what popped into my head. That, you know, shuffling through the leaves and shuffling through the snow and running around a track in the summertime and um, these epic classes. Um, it's, it's where I first got to do some of the more interesting psychology classes uh, that I started to take early on. It was just, it was an amazing environment. And I, I like the fact that although I hung out with the team and had good friends on the team, I found this cohort of, uh, of see the the term regular student doesn't doesn't really cut it, but I, I, one of my best friends is still my one of my best friends to this day, Dennis, and I remember walking by his room and he had a television, and, and, right. and nobody had a television. He had a television and he was watching Star Trek: The Next Generation, and I became his friend simply because I lingered in the door to watch an episode of Star Trek: The Next Generation, and that's what we bonded over, nerddom. And there were so many people who wonderfully saw me not as a basketball player. And I had a really warm response from so many people who saw me as the basketball player, but I managed to have this life that was defined by professors who saw me as this person who wanted to be a psychologist, by, by peers who saw me as a human being um, beyond my skills on the court or not. John, one of the greatest political movements here at Penn State has been the push to get Chicken Cosmos back on campus. <laughs> And back in, How's it in, really? In West Dining Halls, and and they have been unsuccessful. I I don't know. I mean, look, I wasn't here at that time, but it, it essentially sounds like a chicken patty sandwich that was um, that just became legend here. I don't know why we can't duplicate it, but it it's is probably uh, it's probably because it's not proper food. It's probably not proper chicken or proper food. But it's much like hot dogs, I've discovered, that as long as you don't question what's in them, you can enjoy them fulsome. Absolutely. This is the People of Penn State podcast. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined by organizational psychologist, Penn State legend, and the author of the newly released book, Promises of Giants, John Amici. John, Promises of Giants is your second book. Um, and and the Man in the Middle, New York Times bestseller. This effort is a markedly different type of book. Can you compare and contrast the the two books that you've written and uh, how you would describe each of them? 
Um, I think Man in the Middle was uh, my effort to help people to understand and, and uh, define me in a way that I felt was appropriate. When I came out, um, um, people found this surprising. I, I, I still find it surprising that people find it surprising. But people found it surprising. And it led to people having, I think, ideas about me that were not me. I am a geek and a nerd. I am a man with a lightsaber on my desk. And Star Wars is important to me. Doctor Who is important to me. Nerd stuff is important to me. Science is important to me. I didn't fundamentally change right. because of who I occasionally smooch. Um, so I wanted to have something that helped people to understand the life that I've done. Because when I look at my career to basketball, many people think that coming out is this remarkable thing. And I can tell you being gay required absolutely no effort on my part. Getting to, getting to, getting to, the, to, 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 to a scholarship, that required right. massive amounts of it. I started playing basketball at the age of 17. It was six years later that I was in the NBA. Right. That took effort. I was just talking earlier, actually, to, to another client of ours about, and they reminded me of this because I don't think about it all the time, about the fact that just when I was 17, I, I cut my hand off. Uh, every nerve, every tendon, every artery on the mm. top side of my shooting hand was gone. Oh, my. And, and I wanted to make sure that people realized that if you want to think that something I've done is remarkable, pick the stuff that I've really had to choose and fight and work for. Don't pick the stuff that is just who I was anyway. Um, so that's what that book was. This is different. This, The Promises of Giants is different. There is a void of leadership out there. Uh, this is not about political persuasions. This is about leadership. When I, when I define it in the book, it, it's not a position or a title or a role. It's, it's an experience. It's the promise of an experience that you will provide People listening to this, you may not be the most powerful person in your organization or even in your household. But what you can do is make sure that for one person, two people, you provide an experience where they feel safe and they can thrive. And this world is, is painfully short of that. So I wanted to create a book that I hoped would help people through introspection, through skills interpersonally, and through diplomacy skills with organizations to be the leaders that we need. Now, John, you walk into any Barnes and Noble and you go to the, um, the self-help section, you go to the business section, there is no shortage of leadership books in, in those areas. And so how is yours different? How is yours going to move the needle to help fill the void that we are, that we are experiencing in the void of leadership? So one of the things that I've definitely found is that uh, the book uses many business books pride themselves in being as deeply complex as possible right. of being something where, where, where if you can't prove how clever you are to understand this complex convoluted stuff you can't be a leader other books are very focused on business leaders only or community leaders only and this is not that i have tried to keep this to explain sometimes complex elements of introspection, interpersonal skill, organizational uh, diplomacy in a way that is super simple. I illustrate it with stories. I love to tell stories. Probably one of the best, somebody asked me the other day, what's the best thing about my book? And in truth, the best thing about my book is that you get to meet my mom. She is everywhere in this book. Um, and she was a remarkable woman. And I think the combination of her wisdom a decent story or two, a bit of science, and lots of tools. I've, I've made sure that in the book there's tons of tools that you can access so that you don't just have to remember it and try and you can just put up on a screen and this is how I'm going to handle this. This is how I'm going to learn this. So I, I hope that's what's going to make it different, the fact that this is not about your job title. It's about your intent. Well, that's a great segue uh, into talking about what I think is one of the central figures of your book, right? If there is a if there is a key character or a star to the book, it is your mother. You talk about the concept we've talked before about everyday Jedi or of the everyday leader. Um, you use stories about your late mother uh, to highlight this concept. 
early on when you were young, you learned that your mom had special powers. I wonder if you might share a couple of those lessons that you've learned from your mom and that you share in the book. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> there was little I like more than, than talking about her. Um, when I was very young, my mother was a doctor, a GP, um, family doctor. Right. Uh, I always forget what the, the language is. Um, but she was a family doctor. She worked a lot in palliative care. So she worked with people who weren't going to get better. And when I was young, seven years old, I used to go on visits with her to these homes of these people who were devastated with the soon to be death of a loved one. I would never see what she did in the bedrooms with, with, with people who were sick, the, the medicine part of what she did. I would always notice what she did with the families, despite the fact that you can imagine she didn't have huge amounts of time. Often it was eight to 10 minutes for an entire visit. And then in the car to the next. And she'd come downstairs and she would always make time. She would look at a group of people distressed in a room. And before she said anything, it was like you could feel her scooping the room up in her attention. You could feel her connecting. And I would watch how she could make people, I, in my mind, she was making people more able to cope despite the fact that nothing had changed. She'd not made anybody better upstairs. But she, she could make them cope for another week until they saw her again. I, I used to watch her do this thing where she'd say, no, you can do this, you can cope. And they'd object. And then she'd say, no, you can do this. You can do this and this and this, and I'll see you in a week. And I'd hear them repeat back verbatim. And at seven years old, I was like, this is magic. This is brilliant. But at seven years old, 1977, December in, in England, the, um, the film Star Wars A New Hope came out. I watched it with my mum. And 34 and a half minutes in, 35 and a half minutes in the new extended version, there's this scene where Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke Skywalker get stopped in the speeder with the droids in the back. And the film should be over. But instead, I see Obi-Wan Kenobi say, wave his hand and say, these aren't the droids you're looking for. We can pass. And they just repeat that and they escape. And I'm like, I've seen this before. My mum is a Jedi. And I was so excited about it that I missed the next 10 to 15 minutes of, of A New Hope. But it, the reason I was excited, because I knew it, was, it, it meant if my mum's a Jedi, I'm a Jedi. Right. That's who I am. And, and that explained how she did this amazing thing with people in distress. And I thought, what, how amazing would it be to have a job where all you do is use your voice to enable people to thrive, to cope, to manage? What an amazing job. So I went to the library and asked them if there's any Jedi jobs that I could learn about. And that's where this wonderful librarian directed me to psychology. And I think that's that's woven throughout the book is how to use your voice to make other people feel good, perform, empower them. You organize your book into three sections, really 14 promises, but really into three sections. The first one is introspection. Next is interpersonal. And then finally, organizational. Talk a little bit about why you decided to organize it in those three ways. I think th the main reason for the organization was it needed organizing. And my brain is not very organized. And I recognize people, especially with the kind of storytelling way that I, I, I work um, and I write, people need a bit of structure. But the really important point was that most people skip that first phase. Most people skip introspection. We are trained, even through the best universities and through the best families, we are trained to figure out what we're going to do. We mostly ask children, what do you want to do when you grow up? We're not asking them, who are you? What will make you feel a sense of purpose and drive and love for the 50 years you're going to have to grind through work? For the X number of years you're going to have to grind through university if you, if you, use, if you choose that route. And so we spend so much time figuring out, trying to figure out what we want to do. We, we, we forget to examine who we are. And so I wanted this first section to help people to really look at themselves you know the first the first promise is to view myself critically but not cruelly because we all know people 
who have no ability to judge their deficits. They think they're brill, sorry, brilliant. They think they're brilliant at everything. And they're not. And there's other people. It's like they're, they're there to punish themselves. They can't see anything good they do. So we need to view ourselves critically, but not cruelly in order to be able to have this foundation to build on. We have to commit to success. And that seems weird, but most people don't commit to success. They commit to a path well followed. And, and then there's the idea of being understanding the necessity of vulnerability, which I, I pair with boldness in a way that I think is weird for people. But that's the stuff, I think. Knowing ourselves is yeah. key to success in life and happiness. So you touched on a couple of points I want to dig a little deeper on. Uh, the first one is you mentioned vulnerability and the promise to be bold and vulnerable. You know, vulnerability is often seen as a weakness, uh, but you can found that notion in the book. Can you talk a little bit about vulnerability as a strength? Absolutely. There's a number of different ways I think vulnerability. No, no, that's that's not true. There is a, There are a number of different ways that vulnerability is a, a huge asset. The first is that people who are bold without any vulnerability tend to be reckless. And if they don't cause damage to themselves, they do cause damage to the people around them. So vulnerability can be a modifier. It doesn't stop you from being ambitious, but it makes sure that your ambition is pitched at a level that is hard to achieve, but isn't going to cause massive collateral damage. I think that's an important thing in this world where many people are being unnecessarily wounded. But the second part of it is probably best described... Um, I think everybody, even in America, you have the Blue Planet series. Um, in England, it's voiced by David Attenborough, who's a national treasure here. In America, I think it's voiced by um, Oprah Winfrey. Um, but either way you have it, there's, there's, there's always pictures of these big, massive sharks swimming through the, the deep. They've got their mouth slightly agape, these massive razor teeth. And anywhere you see these sharks, you think... I think when I look at them, like that's the archetype of an old fashioned leader, right? Completely invulnerable, um, absolutely able to take anything vicious in a sense, just apex predator. Right. And the problem with that invulnerability is, is demonstrated when you watch the Blue Planet, because anytime you see those sharks, you see that they are covered in tiny little fish that stick to them. Remora, they're called. They stick to them. They don't do any harm. They just add drag. And the only thing that those fish do is swim out whenever the shark kills something and then swim back and suck it back onto the skin. And that's the problem with invulnerability as a leader. That's the problem with invulnerability as a team member. You only attract people who never expect to have to do anything, hmm. who never expect to have to contribute. Invulnerability creates teams that are highly successful when the invulnerable person is truly invulnerable and then collapse catastrophically whenever a vulnerability is found. The other thing that jumped out at me was the, uh, was the need or the role that honesty plays throughout the book. And, and we know that there are many different ways to be honest, right? We hear about people being brutally honest. But I found that you have kind of woven the concept of kind honesty through throughout the book, right? From the first pro from one of the first promises to uh, view myself critically but not cruelly, right? Being kind to thyself, um, but also in the promise to deliver timely and effective feedback that, if delivered kindly, leads to it being effective. To, can you touch on? The, the role that honesty plays in, in a lot of the promises that you talk about? Yeah, I mean, I am, I am hugely uh, a, a fan of the idea of, of being open and plain to people. Um, feedback is a part of that process. I'm not a fan of radical candor, or, or I forget the term that you use, Paul, but that kind of brutal, brutal, uh, yeah. brutal candor. Because I think a, a duty of candor, I'm a psychologist, we literally have a duty of candor, right. a duty to tell the truth, is paired with the duty of care. Because they're inextricably bound. You, you don't lie to people you love or care about. And you don't care about people 
to whom you lie. And so I'm trying to help people to understand that we can deliver forceful, robust feedback to people, telling them that they're not doing everything right without cruelty. And indeed, we have this, this in the book, there is um, something that we use at APS Intelligence called the uh, effective feedback model, which is just a bunch of questions that we ask people to consider when they are planning to give feedback. And it, it, it asks them to think, it is, is what we're saying right now actually feedback? One of the ones that you've definitely uh, alluded to already is the idea of cruelty. And if, is the, the, one of the questions in the effective feedback model is, is it cruel? What I'm gonna say, is it cruel? Because feedback is never cruel. And I know that seems so odd to people, but feedback is never cruel. That does not mean that feedback never hurts. You and I both, I'm sure, in our lives, um, you know, probably on a fairly regular basis, right. get old things that feel, ooh, that hurts. But feedback is designed to develop. So if it doesn't develop, it's not feedback. If it can't develop, it's not feedback. And if it's cruel, it can't develop. So I think that's one of the things that we need to, to help people to understand. Whose benefit is one of the other questions in the effective feedback model? You often see, especially in big offices, you'll, you'll hear a leader yelling at somebody. And in that moment, you realize that the, uh, that the intent and the benefit of this is not the person they're talking to. They just want everybody to know that they're powerful and mad. Right. And this is the thing to consider with feedback. Be honest, be candid, be precise, be specific, but don't be cruel. Yeah, my mind's going in a number of different directions here. I think of, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you saw the example of this, but uh, my daughter is a sophomore at the University of Oregon. We watch Oregon football. We moved here from, from there. And there is a clip that's been getting a lot of, a lot of attention. Um, a freshman wide receiver um, makes, makes a play and gets a 15-yard penalty for unsportsmanlike conduct. And the coach really starts ripping into him, throwing his headset, you know, making an absolute scene. What was most impressive about the video was the student athlete. The student athlete kept eye contact with the coach. He was taking the feedback. He was listening to what the coach was saying. Uh, undoubtedly unpleasant what, what was being said to him. But the only reaction from the, the student athlete was, was yes, sir, yes, sir. And, and uh, it was um, an unbelievable uh, contrast of lack of self-control, right, from the person of authority to a person who's looking to really learn about what that person's saying to him, regardless of how it's being delivered to him. I just thought the example of the student athlete in that situation Understanding they made a mistake and then learning um, was 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 great, and I think that's what's missed in that video is people's focus is on the coach maybe acting uh, inappropriately for the situation. But we should give praise to that student athlete for for how they handled the situation as well. Yeah, while you were while you were saying that, I just looked it up and, and googled it, so I've right. just I've seen the footage. You know, I, I have an allergic reaction to people in powerful positions who abuse that power. Yeah. That is why I talk about leaders as giants in this book. Because when you realize you're a giant, you recognize that there are some things you cannot do. I haven't yelled in 30 years hmm. in around people. Right. In my house, screaming, yes. But not around other people. Because I am six foot nine. I am, I don't know, at this stage, 380 pounds, something huge. I am a huge person. And I know that if I shout at one of my teammates for doing something, even if people look and imagine they deserve it, right. I lose them for a week. And I, and this is the thing about this. I absolutely agree. We should, we should uh, praise this young man for his composure in this most difficult of moments. But we should also recognize he should never been in the position to be the right. composed one in the first place. It is the responsibility of power to recognize our disproportionate impact on the people around us. Coaches, I don't know why coaches still fail to recognize this. How many millions do you have to be paid before you can bite your tongue? 
right. knowing that the world is watching. I'm in England, I'm in Covent Garden. And in seconds from you saying this, I was able to pull this up. And so here I am, a world away, watching this abuse of power. Yeah. And that and this is not about whether that kid should have done whatever he'd done. I, I didn't realize that twirling the ball on the floor and standing there was so outrageous, but- Sure, sure. You know, maybe maybe he shouldn't have done that, but it's just power. These we, this is a university. This is about learning, about developing young people. What do we learn by having our amygdala tweet yeah. <laughs> by somebody spitting in our face? Oh. So I mentioned to you, I had the opportunity to listen to the audio book, uh, still not available here in the United States. Will will be released mid November here in the States. And we encourage people to go out and buy that and, uh, or, or go out to Audible today and download it so that you can listen to it like I did. I'm listening to it and, and I'm, you know, I've spent a career in higher education. I've gone through the unconscious bias trainings, right? Cultural agility. And I'm sitting there listening. I'm like, all right, John's, John's going to get some feedback on his take on unconscious bias, which is which is certainly um, uh, outside of, of what uh, is, is commonly being taught across industry, um, across higher education. Could you share your perspective on unconscious bias and, and how some of these trainings um, may be actually providing an excuse more than mm -hmm. a solution? Yeah. So um, I don't know if profanity is allowed. I would imagine not. But if you read the book or listen to it, you will hear me swear about this. Um, unconscious biases in the British vernacular, bollocks. It's not real. It's bias is real. So before anybody loses their mind, bias is really real. Prejudice that's, that, 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 that grows from bias is real. Discrimination that grows from prejudice and bias is real. All these things are real. But unconscious bias is not real. And that's why unconscious bias training doesn't work. And it is proven not to work across almost every industry that it's been examined. Um, and I say that only because not every industry has been examined. But every industry where it's been examined, it's been proven not to work in terms of actually changing people's behavior. I am a massive black man. In England, I get stopped and searched on a regular basis. This is a familiar story to black people everywhere. When I walk outside, I am deeply, deeply privileged, right? I live in Covent Garden. I don't know what the kind of American big city equivalent is, but it's it's living in the, a nice posh bit of a city. Yeah. And when I leave my house and it's dark at night, as it's getting dark, it's what, half past five in, at night here and it's already getting dark. And people will walk towards me, see me at a hundred meters away, whatever that is in, in feet, and cross the street. And what they want to, to do in that moment is to make themselves feel innocent. They want to say, uh, I didn't do it on purpose. But the truth is that what happens, and there is great data to back this up, is that attention rises in you when you see something that um, has an association that's negative, and the associations that most people have with blackness is bad criminal, right. ugly, dirty, dangerous. And so that tension rises in your chest. But your choice to look both ways before crossing the street is not unconscious. It is deeply conscious. And what we, we the only way we'll change our behavior is by embracing the winds, embracing the discomfort of knowing that when we look at certain types of people, we imagine certain things about them. And knowing that our response to that is our fault. It is ours to control. When you assume every doctor is a man, that is our fault. When we assume that people with visible disabilities are somehow mentally impaired or incapable, that's our fault. We can learn better. When we assume that black people are janitors and not professors, that's our fault. And we can all do better, but not while we pretend it's not our fault and it's unconscious and it's buried in there. You want racist because you were born in the South. You want sexist because you were born in a city. You want, that's not why. 
We can all learn better if we want to. This is the People of Penn State podcast. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined today by Penn State legend, organizational psychologist, and the author of the newly released book, Promises of Giants, John Amici. John, uh, who are some leaders that you look up to? Uh, people that, that you admire, um, that you look to, um, to develop maybe what your next set of 10 promises might look like? Oof, good question. I, uh, so I thought you were going to ask about um, uh, back in the day. And, and I think back in the day, it's interesting, right. maybe my reaction to, to bad coaches is because although I've had my fair share in the pros and in, in, in college, Bruce Parkhill, uh, my coach at Toledo St. John's High School, where I went for one year, uh, Ed Heinchel, who just retired last year. Wow. Um, these people were formative figures in my life uh, and amazing examples of compassionate leadership, both. Um, Ed Heinchel knew that I was alone, abjectly alone as a, as a teenager in America, um, a country when I arrived, I barely understood the words that people were saying in the Midwest. And he used to take me with his family as if I was one of them. I came to Penn State and, and many people who, who know me know that my mother died while I was, right. while I was at Penn State. And, and they, the school arranged for me to fly home so I could see her before she died. Uh, the school, uh, Bruce, held me when I cried. And so this to me is, this is what leadership is, using your power to help other people survive tragedy, using your power to help other people to thrive through disruption. That's what I want people to get out of this book and any other that I write. So you say any other that you might write, what's next for you? What's the, what's the next project you're working on? I don't know. My team keeps telling me I need to write another book already. Um, and that's because they know it takes me two years to spit out anything useful. Um, but I just, I'm in a kind of a bit of a boggle right now. I feel like I'm just discovering how to talk about this book two years after writing it. And, and now it's now it's finally published. Next, I don't know. what I, I'm trying to avoid doing the reactionary thing because I look around the world and there's so much where I just want to point at someone, this this Oregon coach or somebody else, and say, "Don't do that." And I don't. So that there's a temptation in me to write a book that's just "Don't be that jerk over there." Right. But but I want to make sure that what I'm doing is constructive and allows people, all types of people, who are in all types of contexts, to to assert leadership. It's amazing, actually. I was just I was thinking um, because we were coming on this, I saw a missive from Penn State from the Alumni Association came through and there's a picture of Mike the Mailman. And I, and I thought, you know, there's another example, right? What, what, what a wonderfully unlikely but clear kind of leader in his own way. I, I remember my conversations with him when I was on campus. Uh, how wonderful to know that you don't need to be vice provost. You don't need to be head coach. You don't need to be in a fraternity. You don't need to be in a named position necessarily to assert this m wonderful influence on the people around you. I'm, I'm so glad that you brought up Mike the Mailman's name. I will mention to him next time I see him that you remember your interactions with him fondly somewhere on the shelves behind me is one of my most treasured possessions. It was a gift that uh, Mike gave me. It's a framed stamp. Um, it's a framed land grant university stamp um, that is somewhere up there. I see Vince trying to, to zoom in, but we're never going to find it. But, uh, but John, Mike the mailman is an example of good guys finishing first, right? A, a guy who put other people first, who just went through went through life in a, a happy-go-lucky way, complimenting students, asked, learning about students. That um, that is that everyday leader that you talk about in in your book, Promises of Giants, which I recommend to everybody. I hope you 
have already downloaded it at this point in the conversation and um, or have ordered it and it will be delivered to your home soon. John, if people are, they haven't downloaded or bought it yet, where's the best place to go for people to go to find out more information either about your work or about how to get the book? Sorry, the, the typical you're on mute situation happened. So um, there's a website you can go to. You can go to findyourgiant.com or you can go to the prom I think it's just promisesofgiants.com. But either of those uh, will give you some information on how to get hold of the book. The, aud the audible version is available now. The book itself comes out in, I think, the 16th of November. Right. I'm hoping to wrangle a trip to America, but at the moment, our challenge is <laughs> that our COVID numbers are so bad that America is not letting British people come to America at the moment. So, if that situation gets resolved, uh, it's it's I'm long overdue a visit back. Um, I'm long overdue a visit back. Although I will say, the last time I came back to Penn State, um, and this is a ridiculous problem of my own to solve, I I felt so old. I felt so old. I remember sitting at Cafe 210 and looking at the people around me and, and knowing that this is where I belong. And I sat there last time. It must have been maybe four or five years ago. And I just remember looking around me and saying, good Lord, where did the time go? Well, I hope you come back soon. And if you do, let us know. We would love to... We would love to host you and just say hello and, and welcome home to Penn State. It'd be a pleasure. Listen, thank you so much for this. I, I, um, uh, the people of uh, people West Halls, I owe them a debt. They, they, if you were an alumni at that time, I, I remember you s standing in Rec Hall on the sideline goading our opponents. I remember you when I missed shots at the end of the game and you would walk up to me as I shuffled between classes, embarrassed, and you would put your hand on my shoulder. Uh, I remember you and thank you. Thank you, John, for allowing us to share your story on the People of Penn State podcast. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Paul. If you like this episode of the People of Penn State podcast, I hope you'll subscribe on your favorite podcast app of choice. And again, while you're out there, give us a rating or drop us a review. Help us spread the word and share the podcast amongst your fellow Penn State friends. And if you do share it, tag at Penn State alums. We'd love to hear your thoughts about the podcast, about the great work that John Amici is doing. If you're a member of the Alumni Association, thank you so much for your support. If you're not yet a member, go to our website today at alumni.psu.edu, and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Thank you for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are... When we stood at childhood's gate, shapeless in the hands of fate, thou didst mold us, dear old state, dear old state, dear old state. May no act of ours bring shame to our heart that love thy name. May our lives but swell thy fame. Dear old state.